Hello, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Marion Harrison, Senior Lecturer in Fine Art here at Leeds Beckett University. And I'm really delighted to welcome you all today to today's Inside Out Talk, flowing into the computer, streaming out of the projector, with Turner Prize winner, winning artist, Elizabeth Price. The mission of our prestigious Inside Out Lecture Series is to bring the best minds of our generation to inspire and support the work students and staff do across the Leeds School of Arts here at Leeds Beckett University. Elizabeth Price makes immersive video installations which feature diverse historical materials, including film and video documents, plans, photographs and popular music. She punctuates the visual material with bold graphic interventions. She's an artist with a keen and meticulous imagination whose work deftly engages the audience around ideas of labour, memory and social history. She cuts through the muddle of the digital world to challenge political, economical, economic and cultural systems and structures. Elizabeth Price has exhibited in group shows internationally and has had solo exhibitions at Art Angel London, Tate Britain UK, Chicago Institute of Arts USA, Julius Stochsteck Foundation Dusseldorf and the Index Gallery in Stockholm. In 2012, Elizabeth won the Turner Prize for her solo exhibition here at the Baltic Centre for Contemporary Arts in Gateshead. And in 2013, she won the Contemporary Arts Society Annual Award with the Ashmolean and Pitt Rivers Museums in Oxford. On winning the Contemporary Art Society Award in 2013, Price said in a Guardian interview, that art should be a way to understand our time, the time in which we live, and it is a way to apprehend and influence it. I would like to introduce you to Elizabeth, who joins us from her studio in London to briefly introduce her film. Hello, Elizabeth, and welcome to Leeds Beckett University. OK, well, it's such a pleasure to be here um, and to um, have the chance to show you a bit about my work and also to answer any questions. Um, I've made a short film during the pandemic, you know, obviously when we couldn't meet in the way that we used to, um, I started doing these series of uh, lectures from my desktop, from the computer I make my videos on and was able to kind of go into uh, the materials of the video, go into the edits and show, in a sense, a lot of the component parts. And it just seemed a really interesting way to deal with work um, like mine you know in a sense that is a digital artifact but made up of many many other kinds of things so even though now we can convene in person sometimes i still uh, do it like this and so yes it's a, it's, a, it's a video of about 40 minutes and i talk through primarily three works and during the video i show a number of clips from those works um, and also a couple of other clips to illustrate and none of the clips are longer than about three or four minutes, but um, just so that you know as you go through uh, what's happening. But yeah, and we'll reconvene and I'll be available to answer any of your questions at the end. This is my computer. Here, I am opening the edit of a recent work called Slow Dance. Like all of my compositions in video, it depends upon many thousands of separate digital artifacts including photographs, sound objects, animations, graphics, and moving image captures stored in my computer. Many of these things were not originated by me, but sourced from diverse contexts. Often one artifact is already embedded inside another and sits within multiple contextual or technical layers. For example, this is a medieval sculpture seen within a 19th century photograph seen within a 20th century archive, digitally photographed by me. And this is a pop performance shot on celluloid film, commercially distributed on VHS tape, digitally compressed for internet distribution, recorded while streaming on a monitor by me. I gather and make these kinds of documents because I'm interested in the intermedial density and heterogeneous complexity of the digital this interest is one of the reasons why I do not work reductively in composing art. Which is to say, I do not admit as little as I can into a work, but as much as the composition will bear. And with this objective in mind, I draw on forms of assembly that permit incongruity, multiplicity and dissonance. 
As examples, I would cite collage and bricolage in art, montage and weird fiction in literature, polyphony in music and the voice chorus as it occurs in ancient Greek tragic drama and 20th century girl group pop. In order to explore these ideas of assembly further, I'm going to refer primarily to three video installations made between 2016 and 2019. These are K, a two-channel, seven-minute video projection, Felt Tip, a two-channel, nine-minute video projection, and A Restoration, a two-channel, 18-minute video projection. K, completed in 2016, is narrated by a fictional group of professional mourners. They introduce themselves and describe their work here. We are the crystals. We are a group of professional mourners. We generally work private funerals or memorials, but also serve minor state or civic events of sorrow. Tip, completed in 2019, is narrated by a fictional group of office workers. This is the executive level. And that is the cash, sometimes called the store, sometimes the repository. And we are the administrative core, employed to facilitate all proper movement and operations between the two. A restoration is also narrated by a fictional group of administrators, in this instance working for a consortium of museums. We are presently employed to organize the photographic and archival records of several related museums in a single digital database. In itself, this work is not particularly engaging. It mainly involves the duplication and labeling of image files. But... Through conscientious attention to its repetitive procedures, we have developed a dexterous facility at the keyboard with the mouse. And this has permitted a slight but expressive variation in the flows of our work. From time to time we neatly extend our middle fingers a little further than is necessary. We flex our wrists, roll our thumbs, and discreetly copy selected files into another location. The graphic and photographic images appearing in this last clip are from the collections of the Pitt Rivers and Ashmolean Museums of Oxford University. I was commissioned to make an artwork about these museum collections in 2014 and chose to focus upon their documentary images Images made in the course of excavating, collecting, restoring, and curating artefacts. K also features archival materials, namely a collection of photographs of the sun owned by the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, a national science research laboratory. These images were made as part of a project to systematically photograph the sun initiated in the 1890s using glass plate negatives and continuing without interruption until the mid-1950s. This is my own video capture of every one of the slides in the collection. My moving image works often emerge out of research into archival materials and their particular social or institutional histories. But because I'm interested in how archival artefacts can migrate through the digital, I will usually place such materials in compositions that also include elements drawn from other, rather different and perhaps alien cultural contexts. 
So for example, the scientific photography in K appears alongside digital animations of contemporary hosiery looms. An earlier video, The Woolworths Choir of 1979, brings together photographs of Gothic architecture with documents produced during a public inquiry into a fatal fire. Both of these films also feature archive footage of predominantly female pop performers. And along with all of my other works in video, they include elements of the pop song, particularly combinations of percussion, often hand claps or finger snaps, and voice. This use of voice is exemplified in the next clip from Felt Tip. A lead speaking part made of synthetic voice is accompanied by a chorus of three further synthetic voices, which are also repitched to sing. Later. We started to wear them. Later. We started to wear them ourselves. We started to wear them as a symbolic repository of our own long, long memory. Yes, we wore them as a rhyming communique to remind you of the long array. Things haven't gone our way, no. So, we wore them as the longer tongue to tell any located cautionary a soft pen nib to write a supplementary. It was never simply sort of mimicry of executive authority. Though, that was a perk. To some extent, these clips I've shown you exemplify the ways in which I use moving image, synchronizing text, image and sound in complex edits. These compositions are presented in immersive installations using large scale projections and loud amplification. My focus in using projection and amplification is upon the elastic sculptural potential of these media. One of the main ways in which I use them is to magnify. Felt tip features details of British Thai textiles from the 1970s and 1980s, which are enlarged to seven meters high within the installation. This work is typical of how I use projection to permit an analytic attention and also enable an imaginative reverie in response to my chosen subjects, which are often marginal or parochial expressing what might be regarded as minor social histories. My work is rooted in the histories of projection and amplification rather than moving image itself. Because of course projection also has a history of the still image and the graphic document. The contemporary digital projector has replaced three related but distinct prior technologies the overhead projector, which was used for the presentation of data and texts, most often used in corporate and academic contexts. The slide projector was used for the sequential presentation of still images and primarily used in academia, but also in varied social and cultural contexts from museums to nightclubs. And the film projector, primarily used for movies in drama or documentary form, along with advertising presented in cinema programs. Considering the contemporary digital projector as a point of convergence between these varied histories and contexts allows me to move between and combine the different forms of composition and narrative organization associated. Originally, the required work web of the professional male, the necta was used to communicate authority and class distinction. Variations on a diagonal motif, along with crests and insignia, would silently convey a privileged school background, military training, or the membership of elite clubs and societies. As one result of the considerable social change of this period, the demographic of the managerial workforce widened a little to include 
some who did not share this privileged background. These employees, nevertheless, tended to wear neckties that to some extent implied it. Mass-produced ties were taped through high street department stores for designs that also suggested some kind of membership or belonging to something that in this instance could not be precisely deep rooted. It is difficult to be entirely certain now whether this was imposture or parody, but some of these designs include permutations that do imply certain attitudes. In these, the familiar diagonal end take on a resemblance to conduits, leads and wires. They bifurcate and intersect, creating crystal networks, rhythmically punctuated with modular elements. These embellish the tie as traditional crests might, but look now more like nodes, cells, or even memory chips. Considering the projection beam as something through which multiple technical and formal histories flow allows me, for example, to punctuate data from a corporate training manual with the sharp, abrupt cuts of a horror film, or in the case of the clip you have just seen, deliver the content of a design history lecture in the form of a song. I'm interested in the form of the lecture or of the song as cultural objects in their own right. So in incorporating them within larger compositions, I seek to perform their accepted purpose, even if never entirely innocently. In felt tip, I wish to present an argument about tie design and draw upon the form of the slide lecture as an effective means to do that. There are often self-consciously pedagogic or teaching elements in my works, in which objects are named or described and terms defined. In the Woolworths Choir of 1979, I wanted to refer to the form of the architectural Gothic choir. I felt this was pretty arcane knowledge, which a minority of viewers would bring to the work. So I used the first seven minutes of that film to set it out, so I can subsequently build upon and turn aspects of that knowledge in later parts of the work.
I often combine pedagogic and storytelling devices. In a central passage of Felt Tip, I use a fictional premise to collage together some apparently unconnected facts and artefacts. In this section, the narrators tell us that it is possible to store data in human DNA, which is true, this is possible. In the near future realm that the narrators describe, they are employed as physical mules for the storage of corporate data, licensing the DNA of their fingertips to their employer. This account is accompanied with a series of still photographs of Thai textiles shown in close-up, which initially seem disconnected from the narrative. Amidst jokes, sexual innuendos and complaints, the narrators go on to reference aspects of the history of data storage, from the floppy disk to the solid state. Meanwhile, the textiles accompanying the account are selected so as to suggestively, gradually corroborate it, as if they are telling a similar story. Finally, the administrators refer directly to the textiles identifying them as evidence of the very first data storage system, namely the Jacquard loom, and the connection is finally made explicit. The process is relatively straightforward. Even large files like these can be swiftly and painlessly encoded to the long-lasting carried in cells of the loom Eula. This is the pale little moon you can see at the base of your fingernail. Vast scale storage can be held there with no visual trace, but there does tend to be some slight loss of sensitivity throughout the fingertip. So we feel justified in using some of the soft drive's own memory as a substitute and a consolation for this sensory loss. The numbness of our primary digit has provoked a slapstick sense of humor. So we now have a great love of the bad joke, of the old, worn out joke. We are of the definite opinion that when dealing with the managerial class, there's nothing quite as sharp as a very stupid joke. Most of our material is office themed, but never prosaic. We have developed some obscure fascinations with certain technical histories, such as that of the reservoir ink pen or the felt it marker pen. Yes, we have become preoccupied, most particularly with its bright and lovely fabricness. We identify with any supple medium of storage much prefer the floppiness of the floppy disk to the cool solid state. And have collected all this evidence of the very first data storage system invented to direct a mechanical room. Systematic, decorative patterns, like these, which are incidentally, some of the very last made that way. And for bitch, we will now provide a short history, written, of course, in our felt tip. These explicit, explicatory moments are really important to me. 
This is partly because I think that any information that is structurally essential to making sense of the artwork should exist in some discernible way within it. I think it is my responsibility to provide it, to find a place for it, given that the form of my work is a narrative. Rather than outsourcing the responsibility to press releases or museum guides, which is also to claim that the way in which that knowledge is conveyed matters. In K, I want the viewer to discover something about the images seen at the top of the left projection in the midst of watching it. These are images of the sun originally made as glass plate negatives owned by the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. Of course, these details could be provided in a museum text panel and they usually also are, but within the work, I can inflect and direct the knowledge in precise ways. Here, I want to identify the image of the sun and the object of the photograph. I want to remind the viewer that the sun images are the record of a culture as well as a scientific record. I want them to consider what isn't visible in these images, to consider perhaps events made visible by that sunlight now revenant in the digital, streaming out of the projector. We use a particular kind of light to illuminate our action. It is a one and gently flickering beam that creates the appropriate atmosphere. An Orphic loom which helps the non-professional participants overcome inhibition and induces the right run state for the dancers. Sometimes we project an image of the sun as part of the ritual. While very effective synthetic images of natural light sources do exist, we use an animation of photographs of the sun, taken daily throughout the 20th century. So, as we dance, the sun shines on us, just as it shone on certain historic events, on fantastic and terrible things. This helps us understand the gravity of our work, and the provenance of our profession. The origins of our craft are bound into the history of Hus itself. Of that ingenious annular assembly by which means, a single thread, when looped and linked through courses and wheels, can take flexible volumetric form. The circular jig of the mechanical loom, the invention of which coincided with contagious manias of wild dance, draws multiple yarns and swiftly emits a supple, seamless cylinder. A kind of empty loom. Even now, Certain of our gestures mimic the circuits of its shuttle and the gentle swaying of its yield. In a similar way, in a restoration, I want the viewer to know that these ancient unfired clay figurines were probably made, and some intentionally broken, to inaugurate a contract. At the same time, and in the same cultural context, administration was also conducted using the medium of unfired clay. Dried tablets were used to keep records, which could be resaturated to allow revision and erasure in ways analogous to the contemporary digital. I want to detail this history within the work itself so that I can explicitly turn these ideas of the breaking and reshaping of images and laws and apply them to the work's central theme of paradoxical restoration. These clay figures may have been formed and some might have been fractured to mark a contract. So, we bring them here too, to make, and to mark, our own. Whilst many may regard administration, 
as a minor work. We claim an ancient provenance of scriveners, clerks, and notaries. We know that the earliest forms of administration also used unfired clay. Damp tablets were used to make inventories, to inscribe debts, and the occasion of their repayment. When a tablet was no longer needed, it was immersed in water so it might be readied for another use. A different history of transaction or liability. Or maybe to hold a different shape entirely. To the sun-fired clay, we bring the flows of our work. We draw on the most vital gestures. We take on the pressings and the moldings, the incisions and embellishments. And we take on the rough snaps to all. The contract is announced to may have long since expired. But the gesture remains abrupt and will stand no facile care. A different attention is required. what you might call catchy music to accompany pedagogic episodes, often to render them less dignified, less elevated. I have a wider interest in popular forms of moving image that include melody and song, such as the musical or the cinematic melodrama, so-called because it is a drama that incorporates music. These forms are generally regarded as unserious which is to say they are not always considered as credible mediums for thoughtful expression. There has been some rehabilitation of melodrama, specifically the films of Douglas Sirk, who used the genre dismissed as women's film to convey the experience of women and racial minorities in 50s America. But even now, the inclusion of rousing or catchy music in moving image will risk its standing as a serious work of art. It is viewed as trivial, decorative, or manipulative. In particular, the ability of music to arouse can trigger the paternalistic anxiety that the listener's judgment will be overwhelmed. This is not just the old prejudice of high and low cultural forms, but evidence of how that hierarchy is rooted in social class and cultural others. I use such music as a wry provocation of these illegitimate anxieties to create a vulgar outburst, loud and out of place, particularly in the context of working with archives and museum collections, subjects and contexts which bring with them the expectation of rather different manners. Here I should also probably briefly mention my own biography. Raised in a devout Catholic family of Irish origin, my use of music is rooted to some degree in the qualities of sound and song, percussion and reverb that I first encountered in mass, as well as drawing upon the Irish folk tradition of the storytelling song. Of equal significance is my later participation in the post-punk scene. No longer a Catholic, it was through this cultural context that I encountered other ideas of living. The discourse surrounding punk, post-punk and independent music was part of the moment my exact peer in age, Mark Fisher, described as popular modernism, in which there existed transformative access and attitude to knowledge. It was through the social world of music that I first encountered Russian literature, French philosophy and political theory, not through formal education. So for me, the experience of music is connected to the possibilities of critical reflection. 
Electronic music runs throughout a restoration, like a kind of kitsch blue, functioning as a structural element to bind and differentiate archival materials, whilst establishing a non-deferential attitude to using them. But ultimately, I don't really use melodic and percussive music because some find it vulgar, nor even because of its significance in my own biography. I use pop music because of its inherent categorical complexities, how it is so frequently used to convey fluid identities and often combines both arch and effective qualities, provoking the apparently incompatible states of ironizing self-conscious distance with aroused immersion. I attempt to solicit such states of critical distance and intoxicated immersion to lesser and greater degrees in all of my works. One example occurs during a restoration in which I stage a reconstruction of Arthur Evans' notorious reconstruction of the ancient city of Knossos, featuring the paintings, drawings and plans created by him and now owned by the Ashmolean Museum. I try to use the energised rhythm and sugary melodic progressions of the music, both to persuade the viewer of the figurative conceit, which is, see, here, a city is being built, and simultaneously to alert their scepticism regarding it. In the deepest parts of this labyrinth, we carve great, echoing caverns from which songs and alarms may carry. Along every path, to each chamber that we build. We start with silos and cysts, magazines and stores, and ready them for plenitude. We furnish them with great vessels, enough to feed a whole city. We fashion clay channels and shoots to draw water for drinking and to disperse effluent and plumb great basins for bathing. We make dwellings with chambers for sleeping and eating as well as ponds and arcades sufficient for pleasure, fellowship and trade. We elevate facades and grand winding staircases, extending up to four stories in height, serving all those grave, cool spaces of administration. primary preoccupation in this work is with the possibility of a paradoxical restoration, a non-conservative notion of care for the artefact. And this idea shapes the final passage of that work, which imagines the restoration of sound to every object in the Ashmolean and Pitt Rivers museums. In speaking about the sound of a museum object, I mean the sound that object can make in event in the world, the chink of glass, the clop of ceramic, the creak of wood, the clink of metal, and the rumble of stone. Sounds that are silenced by one idea of care in the museum and imagined in the light of another idea, also a kind of care, in my video. In this final passage, 
the congregation of all these sounds, create a grand cacophony. And this is used to dramatize the fall of the ancient city of Knossos and simultaneously to argumentatively enact the fall of Arthur Evans' physical restoration of it. So, we gather the rest of the stuff. We bring the dancing sticks and the blades, the spears, the grooves and the shafts. We take all the stuffs, the sparks, the spars and the swords. We set it all to flow through the space. We have built a space that is shaped like a lovely cochlear. That spiral-shaped cavity of the air. The bright, sharp sound of its arrival marks a small sacrifice. I described earlier how I use music in my work to confound some of the expectations of the manners artists adopt when they work with archives and collections. But it must be admitted that those manners are not so much required by the context of the archive as they are sustained by conventions in contemporary visual art itself. It is a curious state of affairs that what we call critical art often tends to employ familiar, if not predictable, methods and strategies, manifesting in narrow, often literally academic styles of presentation. It is as if the visual strategies of conceptual art have been deep frozen as the language of political virtue. This is problematic for many reasons. These languages valorize the document. In the 20th century, the document had some metonymic standing as truth, but in the evidentiary crisis of the digital, they do not. An artist must respond. Wouldn't a genuinely inquiring art, even when inspired by conceptual art, arrive at different formal conclusions sometimes? If not, what politics is really at play here? In Psyche, Derrida claims that invention is the agency sitting between justice and the repetitive regulatory law that is its frequent enemy. He states that the invention must transgress in order to be inventive the status and programs with which it was supposed to comply. In order to try and be inventive, I don't think of the things I make as art, which is a daft thing to say because they are art. But what I mean is it's not helpful to institutionalize them in that way while I'm making them. I try hard to avoid creating a confirmation of art as it already is. I try to avoid consolidating its existing boundaries and thresholds. I do not want my work to seem settled in and with art. I want it to be and to seem restless, jumpy, out of place, and unreconciled. Hi. Hi. 
Um, and thank you, Elizabeth, for um, sharing flowing into the computer streaming from the projector with us today. For me, the talk was really fascinating on so many levels, and, and there's quite a lot to go at and unpick here, I think. But I think what I found, first of all, really interesting is how you gave us an insight into your kind of digital studio, as it were, the, the desktop, the many tabs, the windows, files and documents rendered both in two dimensions and three dimensions, dimensions throughout the film. And how you also describe the history of an image um, at the point at which you get it, reminding us that photographs were objects uh, in a pre-digital world, still are, but in a pre-digital world, and how they subsequently straddle to those two material worlds. And also in the installation shot that you had of Felt Tip at Nottingham Contemporary in 2019, there were large scale pinhole cam pinhole photographs. I believe in that installation as well. So I just thought I might just open up by asking you to maybe just talk a little bit more about that relationship between the physical and the digital in your process across both image and apparatus as well. And, and I was also quite interested just to kind of point out to those who don't know that you didn't actually start making videos until maybe a decade after graduating from your fine art degree. So I just thought we maybe just start there and then that will feed the questions as they come in. Um, <clears throat> yes, I mean, I started making videos around about 2005. And I really think that the best way to understand my work is not within the context of moving image art, of the moving, ima moving image art of the 20th century, but really within the history of um, image and text, conceptual art, institutional critique, um, that convergence of pop art and conceptual art, which is the pictures generation, you know, people like Barbara Kruger, and in fact, you know, most of my videos actually mainly comprise of still images. So I think although my the medium in which I, you know, and I definitely, you know, my, they're definitely moving image, you know, they move in many, many ways, but I see them as part of a of a slightly different history. And I suppose the reason why I started making videos was, um, you know, an accident of history insofar of, as my age and generation that, or, or videos at that moment, because that was the moment when in, it was possible for someone like me on a laptop to bring together sound making technology, graphic um, technology, desktop publishing, you know, graphic design and image making technologies. And basically I use moving image to converge those three different kind of distinct technical and formal histories. Um, so that's why I'm in moving image, because it's possible for those things all to exist there. Um, and I guess that's why I talk a bit about the projector, you know, like kind of remembering the minor histories of the projector, the, you know, the boring corporate training sessions, the slides, the art historical slideshows and stuff like that, which are part of our, you know, social and cultural experience of, you know, how we've encountered projection, but can kind of get overwhelmed by our, by our sense that a projector belongs to the history of movies. It, you know, there are other things as well. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, really, that's why I'm working in digital moving image, because this moment is possible. Um, but I think it's really, well, I hope it's clear that, um, and, and of course, this moment is also the moment of the kind of migration of many images produced in different ways into, into the digital as well. This is also kind of happening around about the same time and coincidentally. But I think one of the things I'm really interested in is kind of finding out for myself and also communicating through my videos, in a sense, where these images come from, um, how they were made, um, where they were made, who they were made by, and in a sense, understanding that when images come into the digital, they've usually passed through multiple transformations already. So you have that, you know, the medieval sculpture, already an image, right, and an artefact. Um, but then it goes through many, many, many kind of transformations before I digitise it in 2012 and put it put it in my video. And now through my video, you know, it cascades in different ways elsewhere. Um, and I think that's, you know, that that sense of where these things come from um, is very important to me in terms of attempting to understand this moment. What is kind of um, what is emancipating about how the way in which images move into the digital? Um, and also what, in a sense, is um, the kind of problems or anxieties that exist around that. 
Um, and so this sense of attempting to understand more precisely something about how, where these images come from, how they were made, who they were made by, what they were made to do, um, is really, really important. And finally, I think I do, I try to use, like, you know, the immaterial aspect of the projected image is a, a sort of, is immaterial, you know, um, although I would say as a caveat to that, that anyone who makes videos is and attempts to present them understands that it's a, you know, it's a physical and technical problem trying to install video. So the, the, I, I really dispute the idea of video being immaterial and even the idea of digital files being immaterial. They usually exist somewhere in places euphemistically called clouds, but are actually large warehouses, you know. So, um, um, but yeah, in a sense, just to go back to the projection, I try and use the projection to, so I use so much, use it so much to magnify. I get very close to things. And, you know, often using the kind of um, distance between camera and subject that might be between the eye and the hand or even closer than that, you know, like say with the ties, a really magnifying view. Um, because in a way, what I'm also wanting to remind the viewer of or is what I want them to, that which I know that we all have is our knowledge and understanding of the material, of the tactile, of the literal, um, of the relationship between these things and our bodies and in a sense, the sensual phenomena of things which cannot exist in the projection, but which I want in a sense to exist in the imagination. Of, I want, you know, I'm kind of using projector, the project, projection to remind people of what the projection can't tell us. And, and again, also the sound is a part of that. That's why it's often so loud so you can feel it. Um, so yes, I'm, yeah, I'm really interested in, in a sense in this relationship between these literal artifacts and how they move into the digital and trying to understand and navigate that. Maybe we'll take it in two strands. The, the first part of it was very simply, uh, do you see these as essay films? Um, and the second part of that was also the, uh, that music is, obviously really important in your work and we'll maybe come on to talk about that in a moment but do you ever see yourself performing these essay films live so it's a bit of a two questions there to unpick <laughs> um i guess the essay film is <clears throat> I, I would probably say it's one of the forms that i draw on but i guess i try and plait different forms together so you know i would yeah i would say it's 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 definitely one of those strands and I'm really interested in that history. I mean you can really see it especially in some of the earlier films I made that that was obviously one of the things that gave me confidence that I could do this. The, the existence of the of the essay film, particularly the artist's essay film, confident that I could do this um, in moving image. And what was the second question, sorry? I forgot. And the second question, second question. Was, was about the music. And they oh, were <laughs> questioner was asking um, whether you would ever perform these films live or whether there was any like ever any live element to the to the projection. Yeah well I was in a band when I was 18 and um, I left that band because I was felt really shy and I didn't like performing um, and I continued involvement in music recording and stuff like that and I think when I started making uh, Moving Image um, one of the things that was really <clears throat> exciting about that was the kind of kind of reemergence of all this knowledge that I had about music and and I real you know just this something that had been slightly siloed for years in my work and you know it was over there music this other yeah. thing I was interested in kind of poured in and um, that was exciting and really was kind of helped me be critical about the idea of an art world and um, reminded me I'd belonged to another art world before and that that was really important. Um, yeah, I am thinking about doing some performance events, but really tentatively because, um, yeah, I do, I can, I kind of have to, you know, I have to sort of really, I can't do spontaneous things. I have to really prepare for things. I mean, that's partly why the lecture is the way it is. And when I do spoken lectures, they're not that different in a sense. They're kind of very, 
prepared. So um, I guess I'm 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 not uh, one of life's natural performers. So, <laughs> but I do definitely. Um, I am very interested. I mean, I'm obviously interested in the history of performance, you know, and and you know the idea of a the gesture of Donna Summer. Mm. I think that as a really like as a as a cultural thing in its in its own right, and you know, um, they are those sorts of things are in my imagination and in a really in a way that's as that's comparable with you know a sculpture or something like that, and so I. I have a real fascination for it. And so I am tentatively re-exploring re it. You know, I'm thinking that, you know, I'm now at an age in life where I can sort of disgrace myself, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Be less shy, perhaps. <laughs> well, that's great. And actually, I'm quite curious then, just very quickly, did you ever make any pop videos with Tony the Gosh? Yeah, we did. Make did, you, did you author those? Were you in charge of making well, those? Um, yeah, a bit, right? So, I mean, it was a band, so we all kind of did everything together. We had no money, so it wasn't like there was a crew that came along. You know, we did a sort of dodgy video on Super 8 um, without almost any opportunity to edit it. So we did a, we did a couple of those things. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't really say that I um, authored them. I mean, either that that's a, a bit too grand a term for the process, and also it was collaborative, you know. I think it's quite interesting as well when you read reviews, um, when you read reviews of your exhibitions, how people, you know, some reviewers have described, you know, they, they are really absorbing in terms of being the experience of being in the installation and the loud music. And actually there is a, quite a close relationship between the video and the pop video, for instance. And, you know, somebody kind of, you know, there's another question coming up here about, you know, also about the graphic, you know, talking about graphics, talking about Barbara Kruger, talking about typography how do these films relate to the notion of motion graphics kinetic typography or even to pop promos um well i suppose i mean i mean a i'm really interested in the, the history of pop music as a form in its own right you know and in a way as something com comparably important and significant as contemporary art, even though it's less, um, I mean, to say it's less celebrated, I mean, a load of people celebrate it a load more, but you know what I mean? The, um, in a sense, uh, we don't, the institutions that preserve and look after pop music uh, are probably don't regard them as quite, you know, they, they don't dignify themselves in quite the same way that the ones that we have for art do. Um, so I'm really, I'm really interested in pop music per se um, and what it allows people to do, the way people inhabit pop music, not only the pop music they make, but the pop music they listen to um, and how, you know, in a sense, things which are apparently inane can be re used in really incredibly complex, witty kind of knowing ways by people who make it their own in different situations. So I guess I'm interested in all of that stuff, the kind of use or inhabitation of culture. Um, and I think, you know, you know, my, my work does share some characteristics with the pop video. I think probably the most important one, I mean, quite apart from the fact that it has pop music in, is that sometimes the sound leads the image in the editing process. So you get a sound and an image follows or the sound is a cue for an image. Whereas perhaps in cinema, um, the soundtrack is something that possibly even comes after many of the editing decisions made. It's laid on after. Um, and I I mean, I don't think that simply belongs to the pop video. I think it's a characteristic that the pop video shares. I think it belongs to the, um, the audiovisual lecture, you know, um, the click of the slide. Uh, mm -hmm. For those people who remember that, but you know that in a sense, the use of sound to introduce something else happening is not something limited to um, the pop video. And I guess I think of so I kind of use that attribute of the pop video, both wanting to acknowledge pop, but also wanting to acknowledge sound itself as something causal and important. Um, so I, I guess I feel like I have some relationship with the pop video, but then there's loads of ways in which my work isn't really like pop videos and 
actually the sound doesn't precede the image either. So actually the sound and the image and the narration are, co are, are composed simultaneously as I go through the edit, which is why it takes so long. You know, I don't do all the images. I don't make the sound. I don't write the story, then make the sound, then put the images on. It isn't really, doesn't really work like that. So it isn't also um, led by the sound in the production process, but I just quite often give the sound in a sense, the upper hand in the edit of being, in a sense, leading um, the process. Um, and the graphics are def I mean, the graphics are definitely part of, in a sense, um, wanting to give this sort of liveness to, um, you know, there's still images mainly, but not only liveness to the to the images, but liveness to the narration that in a sense, there's an argument being made in the moment. The narrators are there, they're speaking. And so I, I try and in, through the motion graphics, I try to create this sense of this, um, this knowledge being something in formation in the arguments, um, being, you know, the case being made every time the video loops, the jokes being cracked again. Um, and that, so that, so there is a kind of performative, um, you know, I say that very tentatively, but you know, there is this sense of, of these things converging in the moment that you watch it and the, the animation of the text is partly to help contribute to that sense of this core, you know, I usually think of the narration as multiple voices and sometimes that's also expressed graphically, but yeah, that sense of these being voices, arguments, um, to some degree, though fixed in my video, but in a sense, philosophically being unfixed, like the argument is live um, and it's possible to change it or rethink it in a different moment. That, that, that just draws me back to the question about um, the three works that you talked about in, in the video that we've just watched. And, and, and I think my understanding is that this is the first series of works that you've made or something that you would class as a, as, as a series of works. And that K was built on an earlier work that you made um, sunlight. I may be wrong in this, but in my research in 2013, and um, I was quite interested in the idea of this kind of accumulative practice or this accumulation in the process between the works as well, and the decision then to maybe identify a set of works as a series. Yeah, right. Well, so these three works aren't a series, but one of the works in them, Felt Tip, is part of a series of three works, which were yeah, which were made over three years, and you know presented cumulatively. So they built up. You know, one after so first of all, I showed one, and then I showed two, and then I showed three, and they they kind of built up, were intended to build up. They're also shown together in um in a single space. So first one video plays, and then that stops, and another video plays. So I think of them as playing in cycles, um, and you know, so you have this this loop, but it's an extended loop over three works, and yeah, I'm incredibly interested in this idea of um a kind of accumulation. So K is a sort of reworking of an earlier film called Sunlight. Now, sometimes I do that because I wasn't, I'm not happy with the earlier work. And um, so I kind of work it again or work it differently. And sometimes that re results in another quite similar work or I just carry on working <laughs> on the work after I've shown it. And in a way that happens with all of them to some degree, they get worked on. They're always slightly changed. For, for different exhibitions. Um, but I think I'm interested in, I think this in this kind of commitment to and interest in adding and adding and adding to work really came through perhaps the way in which I was thinking before I started making videos, which it was related to the idea of the historical artifact and um, what it was possible to you know, whether it's possible to argue with the historical artefacts, you know, and I found a number of examples that I, I found very interesting over the years of people inscribing commentaries in in books or on record sleeves, both naming themselves or making their arguments. And I just became very interested in this idea of a kind of um, another episode or another chapter that's something that gets added to the document, which in a sense it, you can clearly tell the difference um, between the initial argument and the response. Um, but if you encounter a book in which someone has made, has done, you know, has gone through that process, I mean, in some senses it can be quite annoying, but 
<laughs> in other senses, it is impossible to read the book in the same way. That's partly that's why it's quite annoying. But um, it's also quite remarkable that this kind of commentary, this sort of epilogue is able to transform something as powerful as a already published book. And I guess that's that was my my interest is is always in like, um, yeah, and the, the idea of the power of the epilogue to help us rethink things and also, you know, in a sense to, I guess one of the things I'm always interested in terms of archival or collections history are those things which are not represented or not valued or don't exist in the collection, you know. Um, so, and therefore you do need to supplement the historical record in some way. You can't replace those things that you can't understand those things that were never gathered, but you can do something else that acknowledges that the archive isn't complete. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, so imagination is an important part. And so I guess it's it's partly about that, that, you know, that you keep thinking about what you can add. Um, and I guess that also goes back to my argument right at the beginning of the video about working additively, not working reductively. I found working reductively, I got really kind of lost and isolated working really reductively. And it was only through a decision to write, start working additively what else? I, I'm lost here. What else can I add that will help me figure this out rather than what can I take away because I'm struggling to make sense of it, that sometimes you need more information, not less. I'm not arguing against concision in life and art. I think it's generally a good thing, but only possible maybe when you totally lucidly understand. And in my experience, most of the time in my life, I don't and I need to add something else to help me kind of make my way through it. I think that's really as well. so, yeah, um, about going back and remaking work or revisiting work or kind of adding to work. I think that's that's really important for students to hear. And it just leads on to a question that somebody's just put at the bottom here. And um, do you envy Adam Curtis's position at the BBC where he can raid the whole of the archive, BBC archive? Um, yes and no, right? Um, yeah, it must be amazing. What a privilege. I think they should spread that privilege around a bit more, you know, a few other people should get the chance to do it maybe. Um, but um, I think also, I wouldn't like to only work with one source. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think he doesn't actually, um, I'd have to check that. But I guess I'm really interested in, in a more Catholic with a small c kind of, um, I really do like to kind of plait things together that wouldn't exist together that come from different places and um, and it's really interesting to look at an archive in isolation and you know you can understand an awful lot about the history of, um, of this country through the BBC archive but yeah so yeah it would be great but <laughs> not on its own and anyway I don't think they should offer it to me I think there are probably uh, but yeah certainly some more people than Adam Curtis should get to do it. <laughs> um. I, I'm aware of the time, but I do want to push on actually a little bit past three o'clock, if that's okay, just to just for the students who have been stood outside with the fire alarm, if you're okay with that, Elizabeth. Um, to just go through a few more questions actually that open up a few other um, areas of discussion. Well, the one of them was, could you see uh, your films operating in any other context than the black cube in the white cube of the gallery? Um, well, I I mean, they're always in the black cube, really. I'm trying to think if I've ever shown. I mean, I've, I've very, very occasionally I have made a piece of work that shows on a monitor in a white cube. Um, so, yeah, I do completely transform the gallery into a black cube and um, I change the acoustics of it. And I mean, usually the only light sources apart from these safety lights are um, the projectors. And I use quite dark projectors, so um, yeah, so it's a very particular take on the black box. But yes, I absolutely, um, in a sense, use that tradition of the way in which within an art gallery you can reorganise and remake something and recreate it. I mean, I think that's why I'm in art because the kind of thing I because in a way what I'm interested in the kind of relationship of say uh, certain kinds of literature music and image 
Um, it's it's really difficult to find situations in which you can be really inventive with them in the in the technology of audiovisual. You know, in the last bit of work I made, um, it was like ten projectors on their sides. You know, vertical projectors, um, and this is just really really quite difficult to do. So I think the art context at the moment is a place in which that is what well, you know there's the experimental principle live, lives on in art sometimes mainly only in name but it does live on there the idea that say compared with say publishing or compared with say uh, certain aspects of, of music um, distribution it's um, you know the, there is you the idea of changing everything around is welcomed you know it's kind of part of the point apparently um, so yeah I think I use things that are there now but I would be really I would def if it were possible to kind of be inventive with audio visual like really elastically like pull it apart and you know like turn the projectors on their sides and you know do multiple projection synchronization um, you know outside of art galleries I would definitely definitely be interested in that of course like a lot of music events have lots of that stuff but you know the kind of stuff I do the kind of the kind of economics of it necessitate that all of that work putting it in then has to be on for like three and a half months so um but yeah it's yeah I guess I feel that it's in art because it's possible to do it there um rather than because um I mean I think art is an interesting and meaningful you know I'm there's lots of in a way there's lots of ways to understand my work that is rooted in art histories but they're not of course limited to the gallery so you know but I guess I'm you know I'm interested in what is possible to do there rather than thinking the only way in which my work can survive is in that context I really don't think I think it could because it speaks to other things and I think you know it it could exist in other music contexts or in festival contexts or in relation to literature or in theatre situations even possibly I don't know you know yeah and that leads on actually to um, another question just thinking about the future actually somebody has asked do you contemplate how your work will exist and be archived in the future you know particularly in light of the kind of exponential rate of technologies and formats and how quickly Thing. You know, I read yesterday that the iPods, no more, was it the Apple iPod is, after 21 years has kind of gone. So all that music files and all those things that we might have had on those are kind of, so how quickly and maybe more quickly things become obsolete in terms of formats and files. Is that something that you think about all the time <laughs> or are at a position that you maybe need to start thinking about? I mean, I don't think about it. I don't, I don't really think about it into the future um very much um yeah they're ex the things that you make in, in using any technology are dependent upon the sort of interfaces and the softwares that exist alongside them so okay i mean i guess so when i think about a piece of work of mine there's the film that i export the video file that i export the same you know the one that i loaded up to vimeo like we watch now but i mean that and the whole edit and all the materials and all stuff like that so the film that i export is pretty vulnerable but it's an awful lot more secure than the whole project and one of the strange things about having worked in this way now for 12 years is that i've got like a series of computers that um, if i want to go back into a 2012 film and make a change i go back into a computer and an operating system circa that i was using in 2012 so I just, you know, in a sense, I have to go back in time to the softwares that existed and the operating systems that existed. Um, and, you know, which is interesting, it's a kind of interesting um, problem. And I think, again, this idea that technology is immaterial and seamless and magic um, is, is really not true. It's loads of work, it's loads of in incompatibility. You know it's it's really tricksy and problematic and the archival and conservational issues around it are massive um but yeah i guess thinking about the future um i guess there's bigger things to worry about than whether my <laughs> my videos are going to survive so i guess i worry about it in the in the day to day <laughs> but i don't worry about it in like in terms of like 15 years <laughs> 
it was just a couple of questions. I'll just finish it, Elizabeth, if that's all right. Was, one was, um, are the subjects of your work autobiographical in any way? Um, yeah, there's always a, there's always a seed of um, of of my own experience in it. I guess that's kind of normal. I mean, I don't really. It's only very recently that I've actually started talking about my biography. I didn't for ages because I think it's quite problematic, you know. Um, and in a sense, I don't, you know, that although I spoke a little about my, my own biography in that lecture. Um, I do that not so much out of the idea of my own individual life, but be because of the the importance of specific social and cultural experience. You know? So I guess of that type of experience rather than my absolutely private and personal experience of being a Catholic or experience of being involved in post punk music or whatever. So, uh, but yes, it's really, I mean, I think often there's um, a kind of enclosed or secret private fulfillment that takes place. Or there's an argument that mm -hmm. belongs to me um, in the work. So yeah, I guess when I made choir in uh, the World's Choir of 1979 in 2012, you know, I was really interested in the Gothic choir and um, the idea of multiple voices. Um, but also in that first seven minutes, part of the reason that's really enjoyable for me to make, apart from being interested in that in that that art, the art of the Gothic choir, I think is amazing. Part of the interest is me kind of rattling through the architecture of the choir without deference and kind of revisiting this architecture with a completely different attitude. And and so in a sense, you know, there's these little rewards, I guess, um, these private things you get to carry out, which was only to do with you and your own history and the arguments that shape how you create your own life. Um, yeah, so there are there are those there are those things in it. I, I guess one of the things, the main example, perhaps, though, of how my work is autobiographical is that quite often the narrators are administrators. And I was an administrator in a museum, and this comes up quite often. And I think, um, I think they are those narrators are the ones that come closest to um, attitudinally to be like their jokes are sometimes the jokes that I might make or the jokes that I might find funny. Um, so they're the closest to me. Um, and yes, that, that I've in three films, I think three, there are. Um, administrators narrating it. So yeah, that's and you know, I, I thought that was going to be my fate forever to be a museum administrator. <laughs> um, you know, and I was a very, um, you know, uh, sarcastic and sardonic museum administrator. So yeah, and I guess wanting to carry some of that, you know, it's weird when you end up like I made art for years, I mean, it was, I think, 15 years after I left art school that I started making videos. I think I left in, didn't complete my MA in 1991. So I couldn't get arrested, you know what I mean? You know, you just, uh, I had no expectation that I would ever end up like being able to talk to people over, you know, there's just simply no expectation. And I suppose the administrators, as they exist in the work, as you know, in a sense, that's me with a few different accidents of history, with a different kind of luck, or born in a different generation, perhaps. Um, so, yeah, that's why I think I come back to them. Yes, yeah. Um, as much as I would love to keep on talking all afternoon to you, Elizabeth, I am aware of the time. Um, I did have a question just to ask about how you use language to destabilise, but I think maybe you've answered that a little bit already with talking about the the role of the administrator and the and the narrator and the kind of the humour and the and the sarcasm in that as well. But also, as we saw in the video, the kind of deliberate use of very heavy jargon and a kind of pedagogical use of language as well. I think is is really fascinating. And the, just going off again, just before. Before we finish, there's one final question that somebody's asked, which is, have you read Bob Stanley's Yeah, Yeah, Yeah? Oh, no, I knew, um, I knew Bob Stanley back in the day. Um, I haven't read it, um, but I've, it's one of those things I sort of think I should have read ages ago. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> okay, well, it's now 10 past three, so I think we are probably going to have to draw this to a close. Um, and I just wondered, Elizabeth, if you wouldn't mind just giving us the permission to leave the video for another half an hour this afternoon on Vimeo because we did have 20 minutes outside for the fire alarm. So I think the students probably who are watching would probably like to conclude uh, seeing it in full, if that's OK. Um, but just to say really huge thank you for, for joining us today um, here at Leeds Beckett and hopefully in the future we may be able to invite you back in person as well uh, to come and talk to us. Um, but just say yes, thank you very much. And, and thank, thank you. you. Yeah, so it's been really thanks to everyone for watching, for persevering through the fire alarm and um, for their questions. Um, and just to say yes, thank you everybody and thank you to Bethany and Claire and Karen who's been working back scene, behind the scenes to produce today's talk. Um, and just to invite you to a talk by Andreas Hakadi from Idea to Finish Project on Wednesday the 8th of June, um, 3.30, no, 1.30, sorry, till 3.30. Uh, so for those who are getting that talk at Leeds Beckett, thank you very much and Elizabeth, thank you for joining us. Bye.